Everybody, cl please clear the cameras, please. I want to uh, thank everybody for coming out today, um, especially the media for for being here in the cold. Uh, you guys have been our sword for the last decade plus, so we thank you. 14 years ago, it all started behind me. But 14 years now, it ends here, right here, until 2090. And then Chuck Schumer will have me come back to DC. <laughs> but it ends today, that cloud of uncertainty, the anxiety. It ends where 9-11 responders and survivors and people in lower Manhattan can rest knowing that they have permanent health care. My God, what a beautiful, beautiful word. Not only do they have permanent health care, they will be compensated for their injuries and illnesses. And if we need to come back in five years and make sure that that BCF needs to be refunded, I'm pretty sure the Senate Majority Leader at that time will help us get that done. God willing. Yeah. Amen. I'm, I'm still talking. Yeah. I said this yesterday in D.C. and I had a, I had a, I had to be careful yesterday because they have a, they don't have as tough a skin as New Yorkers. This was our story to tell, and it was our ending to finish. And those who are going to speak, they're going to narrate our story for about the next hour. And it's been an honor and a, hum and a humbling experience to work with the union leaders, the union members, because many of them were part of my team, and the elected officials, and the New York delegation led by Senator Schumer and Gillibrand, who's late and she'll be in trouble. But we thank everybody, we're humbled by everybody, and now we can get on with our lives, and that's what it's all about. I want to take off this jacket, and I do not ever want to wear this jacket again. I'm going to take an hour-long shower, and I am going to wash off that smell of D.C. No offense. <laughs> and I'm going to give this jacket to the 9-11 Memorial, and nice. they're going to hang this jacket in their museum. Yeah. yeah. And then I'll get a new jacket and come back in 2090. <laughs> With that being said, um, our first speaker, and uh, listen, in 2010, I called him the hammer, the closer. And he's been nothing short of the hammer, the closer, Senator Chuck Schumer. Thank you, John. First, this man, he is the best of New York and the best of America. He never gives up. He cares about people, he says what he thinks, and he doesn't take no for an answer. Let's have it, hear it up for John Field. What an amazing answer. Yeah. Okay, what does this mean? What does today mean? It means a lot of things. Most important, it means that Jack's dad, who passed away, all the work that his mom and his son put into this, that work did not go in vain. It means when someone who rushed to the towers tomorrow morning has a cough or a bad feeling in their stomach and they think, God forbid I got it, they'll know they'll be taken care of. It means that the hard work that was done in the days after the tower is remembered. It means that America is not turning its back after a lot of work and a lot of struggle on those great responders who rushed to those towers. And it means the next time, God forbid, there's a terrorist incident, America won't even think about turning its backs on, the ta on those who rushed to those tragedies as they did, as America took too long to do this today. This is Christmas. It's a great day. I was there the day after, the day after. 
I smelled the death in the air. And at the same time, I saw the horrible looks on the faces of New Yorkers. I saw the resolute looks of the first responders as they rushed to the towers and worked on the park. Nothing deterred them. Not the talk of people who said, turn around, might be dangerous. No, not the danger they were facing. Not the fact that they might have found someone they knew, a brother in fire or police who had succumbed. No, none of that. God right, John. They just rushed to those towers. America didn't rush to their side after this happened. It took too long. But it's never going to take too long again. Because any senator and any congressman who is thinking of not helping those who helped us, whether they be our veterans overseas who come back, or those brave veterans of our wars against terror here, they will know the story of what happened after 9-11. They will know that they will not be allowed to say no. Those leaders who tried to give excuses, those excuses were stripped away from them by looking into the eyes of the men and women behind me who said, I have cancer, my cousin has cancer. My, my brother suffered a stroke because of his bravery. How dare you turn your back on them? It won't happen again. So this is a great day. It's a great day for the families who have lost loved ones like Jack's, because their loss has not gone in vain. It's a great day for those who are now ill, like Ray Pfeiffer, and suffering, even though he came down week after week after week when he was being ravaged by cancer, because he knows he has one. It is a great day for the families and those themselves who rushed to the towers and thank God are now healthy, because they know, God forbid, they get ill, they'll be taken care of. It's a great day for New York, because we showed the best of New York, the firefighters, police officers, first responders, and their families who stand behind me. And it's a great day for America. Because, as, as once said, it takes a long time sometimes for America to do the right thing. But it always does. Yesterday, America did the right thing. Can you hear it? You want me to say it all again? Please, no. I said it yesterday, I'll say it again. This woman was a champion, a champion, a champion, a champion. And everybody here affected by 9-11 in its aftermath make as much noise as possible for this woman who's got bigger Abe Lincolns than most people in D.C., Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. You can get louder than that. Thank you, John. Um, I'm very grateful to every single person standing with us here today. And I'm very grateful for those who can't stand with us today. This is their victory. It's a victory that was fought by our firefighters, our police officers, our laborers, our community members, our advocates, families, people who have been trying to do the right thing by these people for the last 15 years. It's an extraordinary testament to them that they have accomplished this goal. Because as you know, nothing ever works in Washington. It is a broken place. And it truly took these men and women coming every week after week, month after month, to the halls of Congress, demanding action, demanding that members of Congress do the right thing and their voices have been heard this is their victory this is their moment when our democracy actually worked this health care bill this permanent bill that will be there for each of them when they need it is the fulfillment of our moral obligation to each of them for their courage for their bravery 
for their selfless dedication at a time when we needed heroes. This is our time to do right by them, to meet their gravest and most urgent needs. Ray Pfeiffer is just one example. Someone who came to Washington week after week in his wheelchair, sitting outside the office of Mitch McConnell to meet with him and his staff to tell his story. His story is like many of the people standing here with us today. Selflessness, bravery, undying commitment, doing the right thing at a grave time of need, and now, unfortunately, suffering, extraordinary pain, <coughs> hardship. As he's in a hospital bed today, we celebrate with him because this victory is his victory. It's for his colleagues, his family, the people who desperately need this relief. I'm so grateful to my colleagues in Congress for their extraordinary leadership and extraordinary work. Our House members who wrote the original bill, Carolyn, Jerry, and Pete, worked for years getting this bill moving forward. Senator Schumer, our champion in the Senate, who because of his strong leadership and his unbelievable power in the Senate brought people together to make our leadership do what the nation called them to do. To make sure Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell couldn't say no any longer. Senator Schumer did that. So I am so grateful to every single person who told their story. Our first responders deserve this. They've earned this. And we have now fulfilled that moral obligation. Thank you. You know, yesterday you said, uh, this is your proudest moment in DC. Well, this is our proudest moment in New York. So thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. You know, before I introduce the next speaker, um, I want to I want to recognize one person. His name is Ben Chavette. Yeah. Yeah. Ben, Ben's the original architect uh, when you worked for Carol Maloney under this, and uh, Ben was my mentor, still is, and uh, he doesn't get enough credit. I gave him the nickname of Yoda, the man behind the curtain, but he's been the mastermind. And along with Susie Ballantyne, they run the citizens to extend the Sudoka bill. Yay. And it was, it, it was Ben, it was Ben who, who uh, wound me up a decade plus ago. It was Ben who taught me how to guerrilla lobby. And it was, it was Ben who taught my team how to guerrilla lobby. And uh, we just added the steroids and uh, Ben showed us the game plan. So thank you, Ben Chavez. With that being said, another cohort of Ben Chavez. Um, yesterday I called him Elvis. And uh, he brings a style and a flair and a, and a, and a grace like, like Fred Astaire. And while we were out there guerrilla lobbying, he did it his own way with class. And um, he's, a, he's, a, he's been a champion. And he's been a champion to the FDNY, the UFA, the UFOA, anything that ends in A, Richie Alley's. Thank you, John. I want to concur on the remarks on uh, Ben Shavat and uh, Susie Ballantyne, two extraordinary people who shy away from the cameras, but they do all the work behind the scenes, and I can't give them enough, enough credit. Yesterday in Washington, uh, I told everybody I had lost count on the number of press conferences that we had had. But regardless of how many we had, I dreaded each and every one except for two. One was in December of 2010 when we got the legislation passed the first time. And then today, for this extraordinary day when we have the legislation passed permanently. Absolutely extraordinary business. Uh, firefighter Ray Pfeiffer, uh, who was just mentioned, uh, has become the face of this particular journey. But the first time around, there was another face, uh, and this man, was a lieutenant in the New York City Fire Department, Lieutenant Marty Fulham. 
Marty played the same role that Ray Pfeiffer played this time as we brought to uh, countless congressional hearings and to countless lobby missions. So if, I, if you could indulge me for just a moment of silence in the memory of Lieutenant Marty Fulham. Thank you. Our next speaker is a woman who has dedicated her entire life, entire adult life, to public service. Starting as a New York City Councilwoman and now as a Congresswoman. She's a tireless worker. Her district is very complex. It has a host of issues. Speaking for the fire side, and also if I could indulge myself and speak for the police side, she has been a loyal friend and supporter of the New York City Police Department and the New York City Fire Department way, way before the devastating day of September 11th. But on that day in September 11th, literally moments after the collapse of the second building, this woman was there with us side by side. And then in the days, in the weeks, in the months that continued after that. And during that time, understanding and realizing what was happening, our members were coming down with illnesses right away. The pundits had told us that, hey, the air was toxic, maybe people will get sick. Maybe they'll start getting cancers possibly in 10 to 20 years. And what happened was they started developing respiratory illnesses almost immediately. Cancers within the first year or two. So she took it upon herself to lead the fight to get federal legislation for health care for these people. On the House side, she enlisted the help of her colleagues, Congressman Gerald Nadler and Congressman Peter King. Pretty smart gal to grab those two guys. Very, very wise. A couple of weeks ago, myself, uh, Local 94, UFA Vice President Jimmy Slevin, and First District uh, IAFF Vice President Billy Ramaka were approached by our members who asked us if we could ask Congresswoman Maloney if she would honor them by wearing the New York City Fire Department bunker coat. The same piece of equipment that was worn by 343 firefighters and fire officers that were murdered on September 11th. The same piece of equipment that has been worn by 120 other firefighters and fire officers that have lost their life in the line of duty since 9-11. After yesterday's press conference, as we were having a nice little private chat, she said to me, I'm very humble the coat, but I gotta tell you, Richie, I don't feel worthy. I can't ever recall having a disagreement with the Congresswoman. I do now, and I'm gonna make it public, so I beg to differ, because it is the members of the UFA, it is the members of the UFOA, who get to decide who's worthy to wear that coat. There are others, I won't discount that, but none more worthy than you. And if you can indulge me with this point of personal privilege, and maybe, hopefully it's not sexist, you look a lot better in that coat <laughs> than guys like me and every, every other firefighter that we brought here today. So sometimes a simple thank you is, is never enough, but that's all we got. So we're gonna say thank you, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. Yeah. Uh, deeply humbled. That's the most beautiful thank you I've ever received, and I feel very, very honored to have this coat on, and uh, it's very warm, too, I must tell you. And uh, I can't think of a, a finer way to say thank you than with the hero's uh, coat. And I've been wearing it day and night during this lobbying effort to remind people of the heroic colors and actions and really uh, just... Uh, Going, doing so much for their nation and for, for mankind. People who contribute so much should not have to come to Washington and, and beg for their health care. But now they're not going to have to ever go to Washington again uh, because we now achieved uh, a permanent health care. Uh, right after 
we vowed that we would never forget. Well, we yesterday turned that vow into a reality of a law that will provide essentially permanent health care for the men and women who risked their lives and the survivors of 9-11. Uh, it's an amazing, incredible achievement, an $8.1 billion bill with $3.5 billion for health care, $4.6 billion for the Victims' Compensation Fund, and it was the efforts of all of the people that are standing here today. 9-11. 9-11 was one of the most tragic days in our history, and the, and the rescue effort was one of the most successful in history. But definitely, the lobbying effort is a model for the country on how to pass legislation and get things done. It was led essentially by the real Twin Towers of New York, the police and fire. Uh, they are the real Twin Towers. But all of the labor unions, and, and uh, really, Susie Ballantyne started out helping to organize all the trips to Washington, and she and Ben Shabbat have done an incredible job. But also all of my colleagues, this was truly the top priority of the New York delegation. From our outstanding uh, senators, Gillibrand and Schumer, uh, to the outstanding leadership of uh, Jerry Nadler and Peter King, this was truly a bipartisan, nonpartisan, working hand in hand to get the votes and when you get 270 co-sponsors, they start paying attention that this is a must-pass piece of legislation. And 77 senators are, are filibuster proof. We, we know that on 9-11, we lost roughly 3,000 people. But 1,700, more than 1,700 have died since 9-11 due to the toxic fumes and the health conditions that they developed. We have over 72,000 in the registry saying they were exposed to the deadly toxins. 33,000 have been diagnosed by Mount Sinai and others as having illnesses and injuries related to 9-11. 4,600 have come down with cancer. 70 different cancers have been found out. And I now meet responders who say they have three cancers and rare cancers, and cancers you never heard of. So it was a, a terrible experience for them to go through. And I cannot believe it is a national scandal that it has taken us this long to get the health care that they so justly deserve permanently so they can celebrate the holidays knowing that they have their permanent health care. Um, it was a labor of love on many of our parts. We started really right after 9-11. Jerry was sounding the alarm that it was not healthy there no matter what government said. And we started saying they were sick. And the government officials said, no, you're wrong, you're wrong. It's not 9-11 related. So we had to go out and get money to pay for scientific research to do the connection between being sick and 9-11. And our former senator, along with Senator Schumer, Senator Clinton, played a very big role in making that happen. And after we got the money and proved the connection, we started with our bill in 2004. And we must have rewritten it at least 20 times, maybe 50 times. Uh, but we finally passed it with a huge effort here and the Democratic leaders, uh, Reed and Pelosi, uh, in 2010. And, and now it has expired October 1. The, the compensation program expires in next October, but we don't have to worry about that now. Because of the efforts of everybody here, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts, all of the electeds, we are deeply grateful. We have permanent health care. We turn the vow into a law. Thank you so much. Before I introduce the next speaker, I just want to personally thank uh, those men and women that I continue to bring to D.C., like Ray Pfeiffer, like Kenny Speck, like Rich Palmer, Anthony Flamia, Glenn Klein, and the rest of you. I was selfish. I took you from your families. 
I took you from your kids. Your wives were texting me at night, make sure my husband takes his meds. And I apologize to all of those families, but it was selfish and it needed to be done. And uh, my next speaker, um, you know, I'm not gonna miss a lot of things about DC, but I'm gonna miss this man. Hopefully I see him in the near future. And I'm out of Abraham Lincoln quote, so I'll make one up. Uh, you have been, uh, you've, been a, you've been a champion for the survivors. And while everybody talks about 9-11 responders, um, we're, we're people, we're human beings, we don't need titles. Survivors, 9-11 responders, first responders, civilians, people low Manhattan, the hell with that shit. We're, we're, we're human beings and you champion human beings. So if Abraham Lincoln had a quote, Jerry Nadler, you're one hell of a guy. Thank you very much, John. For a change for the first time in a long time, I can say it's a pleasure to be here. We've gone through so many of these press conferences in condition of such desperation and such tension that it's finally good to be able to say it's good to be here. When this occurred, when the terrorists attacked us a little over 14 years ago, they killed 3,000 people. But I always said there were three classes of victims. People who were killed immediately by the terrorists. People who were caught in the cloud, in the plumes, and inhaled toxic fumes right away. And their sicknesses and so forth are caused also by the terrorists. And first responders and construction workers who worked on the pile without proper respiratory protection, and members of the community, people who lived here and worked here or went to school here, who came back here when it was unsafe to do so because their government was telling them it was safe to do so when we knew perfectly well it was not. And the people who worked on the pile, I don't fault anyone for the first three days when we may have recovered people and saved their lives. But after that, it was a cleanup operation, not a recovery operation. And people should not have been working there without proper respiratory assistance. But government officials, federal, state, local, were telling them it's safe. Go back to work. Don't worry about it. And some of us were saying, don't go back to work. Don't go back to Stuyvesant. Don't go there. Don't work on that pile without respirators. But they did because they believed government and they believed that they had a job to do and they're suffering for it today. So that's a double moral obligation that we have. One, because you don't leave wounded on the battlefield and these people, the first responders and others were wounded in an attack on the United States. And second, because a lot of people are sick, not because of the terrorists, but because of malfeasance by government, by the United States government and the city government. So there's a double moral duty, and I've always felt that we had that double moral duty that we had to fulfill, and we finally have. And we finally have passed permanent legislation, or permanent till 2090, which is pretty permanent, for the first responders, for the community members, for the survivors. And they all need it and we have discharged our moral burden finally. And finally, we can say that the United States does not leave wounded on the battlefield, that we pay our debts, that we are true to those who serve us, not only on Memorial Day and on Veterans Day and in rhetoric, but in reality, and that those who we ask to serve us in the Middle East, or in Afghanistan or wherever, God forbid, in the future, can know that they can depend on us, that they're not on their own if they're wounded. So God bless America and thank everyone, all the labor leaders and the members and the firefighters and the John Fields and everyone who participated in this because we have redeemed the honor of our country.
Before I introduce our next speaker, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of uh, elected uh, leaders here today, the New York City Police Department and the New York City Fire Department. I was teasing him yesterday because he comes from a police family. I try not to hold it against him. Apparently, my comments must have got to him because today he has a New York City Fire Department sweatshirt. <laughs> it's official uniform, so I'm going to assume that the fire commissioner gave him permission to wear it today. I can't say enough great things about him, and it's just another one of those occasions when a simple thank you is just not enough, but it really is all that we have. And we're so grateful for him being part of that team with Carol Maloney and, and, and Jerry Nadler. It's my honor to introduce Congressman Peter King. Thank you, Rich. Now I have to explain to Patty Lynch why I'm wearing this shirt. But in any event, <laughs> oh, Chuck wears both. What can I tell you? I can't keep up with Chuck. Listen, this is a great, great day to celebrate. Celebrate the memory of those outstanding cops and firefighters who answered the call on September 11th, all the construction workers who followed up during the recovery, and also to celebrate the fact that those who are suffering today, who are suffering from the sacrifice they made then, are going to get the permanent health care that they need. This is the very least we could do for them. We did it. Thank God it took so long. Unfortunately, what has been done, because of great effort, Chuck in the Senate, Kirsten, Jerry, Carolyn Maloney, and on Dan Donovan, the first thing he did when he got elected to Congress was sign on to this the Droga bill. This was a combined effort, a bipartisan effort, an American effort. And that's what it was on 9-11. So nobody cared if you were Democrat or Republican, male, female, whoever you were, you were an American, you fought for your country. When you, you went in, you do what had to be done. And we see the terrible illnesses that so many of your friends and neighbors and constituents have had to suffer over these years, and unfortunately will continue to suffer. And those who are not sick today that may be sick next year or the year after, at the very least, they will have the peace of mind, and their families and friends will have the peace of mind of knowing that they will get the care that they deserve and they're entitled to, the very best possible care. There's been a long, long, hard fight. As I said yesterday, I've seen more of Carol Baloney and Jerry Nadal in the last 14 years than the one that I ever wanted to see. <laughs> <laughs> but very seriously, we're, they're great friends. They've done a great job. Curse in the Senate, Chuck in the Senate, all of us standing together, but all of you, all John Field and Susie Ballantyne, Ben Shabbat, Dennis Hughes, Mario, so many people, Pat Lynch, I can see Cassidy, over the years, all the guys, all the women who stood together. It was, it was some dark days there. We got it done in 2010. And because of all of you, we got it done yesterday. So thank God for you. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. God bless America. Yeah. Our next speaker, um, the dean, the dean of all congressmen, the Mac Daddy, the boss, the one who slaps everybody on the ass when they get out of line, Charlie Rangel. I have never felt more proud of being an American and serving in the Congress than I've had in these last uh, few years. I've been in combat and I can tell you that when you're about to face terror and a nightmare, you never know what you're able to do or what you are going to do. And we've been blessed, this great United States of America by the Atlantic and the Pacific, and we've never known what it's like on the mainland to be attacked. I was in New York City when this happened. We had no idea what was happening to us. And we darn sure had no idea how the heck we would respond. I came down here in that day and saw people just coming up with food, with water, to see our people in uniform, our responders, just reaching out, wondering who could they help. And for the first time, we found out the hard way just what we're made out of, not just as Americans, but as New Yorkers to see how we work together. That morning, Chuck, when people got together, Republicans, Democrats hadn't talked to each other for decades. We came together to thank those who really reached out. And in the Congress, little Carolyn Maloney 
was able to be our Statue of Liberty and saying, hey, we're not going to stand for it. She and Jerry never got together. We recognized that, hey, we need someone on the other side of the aisle. And I can tell you this, in the House of Representatives, I don't allow anybody to talk about any Republicans unless they exclude our buddy Peter King. Because Peter King, he stands 10 feet tall, not just on this issue, but whenever I see it, I stand. And of course, what a duet we had in that Senate. To have Senator Gildebrand there with a powerhouse from Brooklyn on the other side, I tell you, having the opportunity to let the world know that when they hit America, when they hit New York, we don't forget those who didn't stop to wonder what the heck they were going to do or whether they were going to have a press card. This is an example of what America is all about, that we don't leave our wounded behind, that those that have the courage to go out and help others can depend on our partnership. This is a day for America. This is like that Iwo Jima flag that stood up there. It's a symbol. Don't mess with New Yorkers and don't mess with the United States of America. Yeah. And God bless all of you. Yeah. Cooking, Charles. You're cooking. We have a term in the New York City Fire Department for new recruits. We call them probies. So our next speaker is a congressman. He's also in that category. He's a probie. But I got to tell you, most people, when they, when they start a new job, they usually kind of settle in, get the lay of the land, learn the ropes, and then plunge in. Not this guy. I mean, he literally got off the plane, got sworn in, found out, how do I sign on to this legislation, co-sponsors it, and then for the last several months, whipped his staff into shape. They're probably all sleeping this weekend because it was tireless. I mean, we had the ball on the 10-yard line, and I know that everybody has worked on it for so much longer, but to come down in the home stretch, he was tireless, absolutely tireless. The New York congressional delegation is uh, fortunate to have a new member of his stature. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to introduce Congressman Dan Donovan. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Senator Gillibrand, Senator Schumer, my friend Pete King, who has led this fight for the last 14 years, Jerry Nadler. I mean, the work that these folks done is just tremendous. People will never know the efforts that they made on behalf of our, our heroes. When I decided to run for Congress, people said, what are your goals to go down there to do? This was the major objective. This is what I want to do. I represent the 11th Congressional District in New York. We have more people in the registry for the health fund than any congressional district in the entire United States. Over nearly 7,000 people in Brooklyn and Staten Island are suffering today because of the heroics 14 years ago. They're firefighters, they're police officers, they're people in the, the, the trades, the building trades, the construction workers who started on a rescue effort, which became a recovery effort, which eventually became a cleanup effort. None of them went in there thinking about their own health. None of them went in there thinking that they may get sick one day. And none of them ever thought that if it happened, their country would turn their back on them. That day, they answered their nation's call. Yesterday, our nation answered their call. Thank you so very much for my colleagues in Congress. Thank you for the advocacy that the workers have tirelessly did for the last 14 years to get this ball across the goal line, as Richie Alley said. And we committed years and years ago that we'd never forget you. Yesterday, we remembered. Thank you. Before I introduce my next speaker, you know, I was just thinking, is anybody from the mayor's office here? Anybody? What a great idea it would be if um, the mayor could give Ray Fife uh, a key to the city. So, Maybe one of you uh, elected officials who have a little clout, I don't know. Maybe, anybody? I know Ali's has more clout than most of you. So maybe a, a, a nice key to the city for Ray Pfeiffer. So maybe on three, on three we all say give Ray a key. One, two, three. Give Ray a key. 
Ray and Key, just saying. I was never a cop. Not gonna pretend to be one. I was never a firefighter. I can't imagine running into a burning building, nor would I want to. But I served my country in the United States Army. And I know it is to protect people. And I was proud of that service. And like the next speaker, he served in the United States Army. And I'm proud to call him my friend, and he's my congressman. And as a freshman congressman, he joined the cause, he got on board, and he helped us get this across the finish line. Congressman Lee Zeldin. I am so incredibly honored to be here this morning. John Feel, who is a, uh, a celebrity constituent of mine now, our 9-11 first responders who were here that day after, Senator Schumer was here the day after, many of our electeds were. At that time, I was in uh, Army ROTC. I, I wasn't here. I, I wish I was. But I knew that so many who were serving as FDNY, as NYPD, all those first responders who were here with that recovery effort, for all of those who were serving in our nation's military, while we were tested, there was no limit to the potential in the way that we would re rebuild stronger than we were before. To be here now 14 years later, in the presence of these men and women, I will tell you that at no point this year did I ever doubt that this was gonna get done. Because there's no limit to the influence of these people here when they work together. Over Thanksgiving weekend, Senator Gillibrand calling multiple times, not just me, but all members of the New York congressional delegation. Senator Schumer using all of his influence in the Senate to whip votes and support to get this done. I can't say enough about Carolyn Maloney with her efforts and Jerry Nadler, Pete King, Charlie Rangel, Dan Donovan, everybody working together across party lines. And I will say one thing, Pete King, Dan Donovan, Chris Gibson and I, we had a meeting with Paul Ryan right after he got sworn in. And at no point was there any doubt whatsoever? He made it crystal clear that this was gonna get done before the end of the year. But there's no way it would have been finished if not for the efforts of our senators to bring this across the finish line. So for me, me personally, on behalf of our 9-11 first responders from the 1st Congressional District of New York, it's an honor to share the foxhole with all the men and women who are here, who wow. took dozens of trips to Washington to ensure that we would have this victory here in time for Christmas. Thank you to all of our first responders. Before I introduce our uh, next speaker, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some uh, UFOA executive board members that are here today. Senior man on our board, Jimmy McGowan, George Farinacci, John Farina, Jimmy McCarthy, and Derek Harkin. These guys are uh, enormous help, part of the many, many uh, bus trips to, down to Washington. Well, I got to sit on a comfortable train being down there as much as I didn't want to be down there. I certainly didn't want to be on a bus. And let me tell you, it's a difficult job. Also managing uh, the sick and dying members that we would have on that bus and to have them ready and prepared to do their job once they got to Washington. Everybody knows the competitive nature of New York City's police department and fire department. There's probably nothing more exciting than being at a uh, uh, police fire boxing match, a fire police hockey game, a fire police football game. I can't either. Or, or a pin job, yeah. But New Yorkers benefit from that, uh, from that competitiveness is, uh, it really is, there's, there's nothing like it. But there's one contest that's going on that uh, neither one of us wants to win, unfortunately. I mentioned earlier that uh, the New York City Fire Department has lost 120 members of service since 
the New York City Police Department uh, just broke the 100 barrier. Uh, this is devastating. This is catastrophic. It, this is something that we, we deal with on a daily basis. Pat Lynch has been president of the PBA for uh, over 12 years, may, may, maybe more, but was involved in this fight from the very beginning in getting the legislation passed. He was at the many press conferences, part of many uh, lobby teams down in Washington. In addition to doing all of the difficulty duties that he has in representing over 30,000 uh, of New York's finest. Extraordinary work. So he's not only concerned with uh, dealing with the bad guys, he's out there fighting for the good guys. Uh, all of New York it benefits by having this man as president of the New York City uh, PBA. It's my honor to introduce Patrick Lynch. Thanks very much. You know, we oftentimes talk when we come here and we stand in the heat, we stand in the cold, but we stand here to get this job done, and we did. And there's an awful lot of folks that deserve uh, the thanks, our electeds, the representatives in labor, citizens that live and work around here that stopped and bowed their head and prayed and helped and lobbied along with us. And we thank each and every one of them. And I know there's folks whose names aren't getting mentioned that did yeoman's work. We thank them as well. We thank our first responders that, as we all know, responded here without question. Didn't look at what patch was on their shoulder or shield on their chest and did what we had to do to bring as many home as we could and to give closure to as many families as possible. So we thank our first responders. We also thank them. Remember, each one of these lobby trips, each time we went to Washington, each time we stood here, there was a first responder that had difficulty walking. They walked anyway. Difficulty standing, they stood here, stood on a train, stayed on a bus and stood in a hallway. They did it anyway. There's many folks that had difficulty breathing, but they took that deep breath, made them heroes once again, and they did what they had to do. But while we chose the professions, we chose to fight the fight, that was a, a choice that we made. Many times our families didn't make that choice with us, but they sacrificed more than us. So we're here to thank all the folks that got this done. We thank all the folks that prayed and bowed their heads in memory of those that are no longer with us, but started with us. So we have some folks we have to thank as well. We have to thank our families, because every time we got on that train, they packed our bags. Every time we went out that door, they worried till they heard the key in the apartment door and we got back safely. They called to make sure we took our meds. They called our partners to make sure we did what we had to do and that we were all right. So we chose to sacrifice. We thank those that helped us. We thank our first responders, but more than all of them, let's thank our families who sat on that couch and worried. There's probably no more difficult uh, job in uh, labor than being a representative of over 3 million uh, New York State uh, union employees. Several years ago, the then president, who I mentioned earlier, of the New York State AFL-CIO, Dennis Hughes, uh, made the decision that the New York congressional delegation needed all the help that they could get and took on the enormous task of taking responsibility for the many union members that were coming down with illnesses and dying. It was a tremendous undertaking and caused significant money. Tens of thousands of dollars were going to have to be spent to make the trips down to Washington. Dennis Hughes had that difficult decision at that time. He made it and it was the right choice because we got the legislation passed. Two years ago, the president that took over after him, and he's elected by all of the trade unions of, uh, all of the unions that are part of the New York State AFL-CIO, the cream rises to the top. But he was also faced with the same decision to do it again this time around. Only he was dealing with even more sick and dying members. He was dealing with even more substantial costs in what it was going to be to get the job done. And let me tell you, we have never been better served than having a man of his stature. There was a thing called leadership 
It's something that it can't be taught. It's, it's, it's just a gift. Some people have it, some people don't. This man has it. All of New York State labor benefits from it. My honor to introduce President of the New York State AFL-CIO, Mario Salento. Thank you, Richie. It's much too kind, but thank you. Uh, look, there are so many people we want to thank today, and we should thank today, and we will thank today. But as Richie pointed out, I, and on behalf of the two and a half million members of the state AFL-CIO and all working men and women, we all owe a debt of gratitude to Dennis Hughes for what he did, not only on this effort, and Dennis is here today somewhere, but for 12 years serving the men and women of this state. Dennis, we owe you a debt of gratitude. Thank you. He really was there from the beginning, and, and I have to say I had the privilege of working with Susie Valentine for 20-some-odd years, and other than the, the men and women standing up here, there is no other ty more tireless effort, uh, advocate than Susie Ballantyne, who's kept us all on our toes for so long. So Susie, thank you for well, Susie is. I'm just going to be very brief. What I really want to say today is this, that we owe a debt of gratitude and thanks to all of our political leaders who are standing here with us today because of their leadership. They led by example. They led by educating their colleagues in both houses of Congress and on both sides of the aisle. Because what we've said from the beginning is this is not and never has been just a New York City issue or a New York State issue. This has always been an issue of national importance and consequence. And as a result of that, we're here today and I want to thank them for that. I want to thank all of the labor leaders here, here today. I, I know obviously Patty Lynch and Steve Cassidy, Jake LaMonda, Mike McGuire, and, and not only them but their unions and the members that they represent this is what the labor movement is capable of accomplishing when we all work together, public sector, private sector, building trades. And what makes this so unique is that over the last 14 years, this had to still be a laser-like focus on this issue. You see, because over 14 issue, years, issues come and go, priorities come and go, but the dedication and the commitment of those labor leaders behind me and their unions to never lose focus and to always say that this issue would remain the priority of the labor movement in this city, in this state, in this country, really speaks to what leadership is all about. So I want to thank all of them here today for what they've done. And I'll just say this, we've said it countless times before, we all understand that that attack on 9-11 was, and the, and the ground zero afterwards, was a battlefield. It was a battlefield that day, the weeks and the months thereafter. And we've always hearkened back to what they say in the military, that soldiers don't leave other soldiers behind. And what we promised as a labor movement was that we would never, ever leave our brothers and sisters behind on that battlefield. And today I'm proud to say, mission accomplished. And we take our brothers and sisters side by side and shoulder to shoulder, and we carry them forward, uh, forward with us into the future that they so justly deserve. Thank you very much. Our next speaker has uh, been a, a friend and colleague of mine for uh, over 30 years ago. I didn't know him before he came on the job. We had mutual friends. We became instant friends. I never had the opportunity to, to work in the, in the same firehouse with him or in the same uh, battalion. But now, uh, as, as president of my union and being on the executive board, we get to work together on a, on a daily basis. It's a sincere pleasure. Uh, to, to work with this man who has uh, dedicated his life to uh, the, the labor movement. He takes labor very, very seriously. Earlier, uh, when we mentioned uh, Ben Shavat and uh, Susie Valentine uh, with the Citizens for the Extension of the James Adroger Act, uh, both the UFA and the UFOA have a seat on that executive board. Uh, I represent the UFOA on that board, and many times uh, ben Shavat and Susie Valentine would come to me with something that they needed. We need, we need the, we need the UFO way to do this, or we need the UFO way to do that. I'd roll my eyes and say, "Oh, okay." I'd go back. I'd speak to uh, to 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 President Lamunda and the executive board. This is what they're asking. This is what we need to do, and the answer was always yes. Not easy to make these answers because we are not a very big union, but the commitment was beyond our scope. We had no choice. So we had to expend a lot of money and a lot of manpower. A lot of people associate me with the UFOA 
on this on this legislation. But that was only because a decision uh, made by President LaMonda and the executive board, we all can't be there. So they took it upon themselves to take the burden off of me to allow me to be where I had to be to represent our members. But they were always there in solid support. And I'm very grateful to President LaMonda for making those decisions. So really, a lot of the credit on the UFOA side is, is, is definitely deserving of, uh, of, of Jake LaMonda. So it's my honor to introduce my friend, my colleague, President Jake LaMonda of the UFOA. Thank you, Richie. Today is a day of victory. Today is a day of thanks. But this victory, make no mistake about it, came at a tremendous cost. And that cost is with so many lives that we have lost. And we should pause and reflect for a moment for every single life that we lost on that day and the days to come. I want to thank the New York delegation because I'm going to tell you, this New York delegation stood us by, by our side since day one. They stood as tall as those towers once stood. And without our New York delegation, we would have never got this done. And my grateful thanks to each and every one of you. On behalf of the women and men of the New York City Fire Department, I'd like to say God bless America and thank you. Our next uh, speaker is a, a guy that busts my chops a lot, much like uh, Peter King. Well, one of the great, <laughs> one of the great things about uh, being a member of the New York City Fire Department is being part of a uh, of, of a of a brotherhood. Uh, I've known Steve Cassidy for a long time. Uh, I've admired Steve Cassidy for a long time. He's a he's a tremendous uh, labor leader. Matter of fact, he's the the longest serving president of uh, the UFA, a union that. Uh, can be volatile at times and has always had the mentality of throw the bums out kind of thing. So to keep, uh, to keep a cohesive uh, board uh, to lead, much like uh, Patty Lynch has a, a very large union, Steve represents over 10,000 of uh, New York's bravest, is a very difficult job. And to be in that position uh, re-elected time after time, I think he must be doing something right. Uh, he's hardcore labor not only just on the issues uh, that are that, uh, responsible in the New York City Fire Department, but the, the labor battle in general. He's always there, he's always boots on the ground. He's a, he's a tough guy. I hate to admit that in public, but I have to. <laughs> this is a sincere day from the bottom of my heart, Steve. You are a tough guy and, and uh, I'm, I'm proud to call you a friend and I'm certainly proud to work alongside you as a, as a labor leader. My honor to introduce President of the Uniform Fire Fighters Association, Mr. Steve Cassidy. All right. All right. It's a long time coming, but today is a great victory. I think there are three things that come out of this that we should all remember. Uh, number one, we wouldn't be here if we didn't have bipartisan leadership in the Congress to get this done. It took too long, but we got it done. And we got it done because we were able to work across the aisle and make sure people on both sides realized that this was a just cause. I think the second thing is that it's a victory because, and the because is because we have so many sick and dying firefighters and police officers and first responders. So in the midst of that victory, we have to recognize, and I think we all do, that there's disaster looming for so many families. It's a great day to win, but when you win because you suffered so much, you have to remember that's really not a good win. So for those families that are sick and dying, for Ray Pfeiffer, who was one of the firefighters who, despite his illnesses, despite how sick he was, never stopped going to DC. He's not here today because he's in the hospital. For Ray and for all those other firefighters and police officers, I, th I say thank you. And I think 
the last thing that comes out of this is I think this is a victory for the United States of America. I think it's a victory because when five, if anybody thinks we're not still a threat, under threat, they're naive. I think that that message from Congress is if you do the right thing, we'll take care of you and your families, and that's a victory for this country. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the uh, Detectives Endowment Association, uh, uh, Paulie Giacomo, and uh, a word about uh, Paul. And uh, last week I, I had the honor of uh, being a part of a, uh, a police ceremony that was held in Washington. It just it involved uh, uh, photos and, and uh, murals that were painted involving scenes of uh, September 11th. And, Knowing all of the over 100 members of the New York City Police Department that have been lost due to, to 9-11, it seemed that the detectives have a disproportionate amount. And I didn't understand why until it was explained to me that once this was made a crime scene, that it was up to the detectives to comb through all of the debris. They probably, of any group, were on top of this uh, contaminated, uh, toxic, material more than anyone and they are suffering at all. Paul also uh, made a personal loss in his life two weeks ago. His sister Diane, who was a law enforcement officer in the Humane Society, the ASPCA, who was responsible for rescuing all of the animals that were left in apartments when people had to evacuate. Well, she died two weeks ago. We can have a moment of silence for Diane DiGiacomo. And now I'll introduce Vice President of the Detectives Endowment Association, Paul DiGiacomo. Good afternoon, or good morning. The Detective James Adroga Bill lives on forever. Let's give that a round of applause. You know, I'm here simply uh, on behalf of the over 30 detectives that lost their lives and the hundreds that are, are sick right now, simply just to say thank you. On behalf of all our over 16,000 active and retired New York City detectives, I'm just simply here to say thank you to the New York congregation. And on a personal note, on behalf of my family, I'm here to say thank you. My sister died on November 20th of this year at 1.43 p.m. And she's the first human law enforcement officer to die in the line of duty in New York City. So she could finally rest in peace. Our detectives and law enforcement officers and firefighters that died in the line of duty can finally rest in peace. And the people that are sick and moving forward have a peace of mind now that they will be able to get the medical treatment that they need. So on behalf of everyone here in New York State, New York City, our detectives, I don't know, there are no words to express our thanks to you. It will never be forgotten. We will be here for you forever. And thank you from the bottom of our hearts. running a little late, so we'll ask our next couple speakers to speed it up. Um, listen, our next speaker, I did not know we were going to wear the same scarf, so don't think she called me this morning and I said I'm going to wear my red, white, and blue one. Um, she's been a champion for the survivors, and uh, the survivors have always been included in my rhetoric. Um, they are human beings like 9-11 responders, and I love them all. Catherine McFay Hughes. Good morning. Um, for those of us who live down here, work down here, went to school down here, especially those before 9-11, today has a special meaning. The first responders were not just heroes, they were not just doing their duty, but they were coming to save our homes and protect our families. The area workers also jumpstart a community in its darkest time. We can never pay back 
the debt we owe to those who lost their lives that day in the 14 years since. But we can pay it forward by making sure that the responders and survivors who still suffer from the after effects of 9-11 get the care they deserve. This is more fair, this is more than justice, this is a debt of honor. A terrible sacrifice was made and it was made for us. God bless the responders, God bless this neighborhood, past and future, and God bless the United States of America. Our next, our next speaker, um, you know what's cool? We had 272 co-sponsors in the house. You know what's even cooler than that? Having 460,000 United States veterans back in 9-11 responding. The President and CEO of the IAVA, Paul Rykoff. Thank you very much. Give it up for John one more time. You need a field general in every fight, and he's been our field general. And I know I speak on behalf of a lot of New Yorkers. I hope you run for office, man. We need you out in front. Um, you know, I know. No, he didn't tell me to say that. So. Uh, look, I, I know it's cold here, but I just want to share with everybody, it's five degrees colder in Afghanistan right now. And right now, folks are over there fighting and dying, and in Iraq, and around the world, and many of them started here at Ground Zero. My first combat deployment, I never thought it was going to be that way, but my first combat deployment was at Ground Zero. And we got through that because we stuck together. There were no Democrats, no Republicans, Army, Navy, Cops, firefighters, all together. That's what we can do as Americans when we're united. On that day, we were united. In Iraq and Afghanistan, we are united. And this is more than just about Ground Zero in New York. This is about America. This is the conscience of America. And the veterans are the conscience of America. And we are calling. And we're sending a message that we shouldn't just stop here. We can be what happens when we stick together and take on big problems in defense of our country, in defense of America. And we're going to need you next year because our veterans need you. 22 million veterans in America, 3 million who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, over a quarter million here in New York City. We now have a Department of Veteran Services, and that's a good step forward. But tonight, veterans will sleep on these streets, and we will lose veterans to suicide, and they will be unemployed. And we need this same coalition to keep that fight going. We've sent a message that if we are united, we can do anything. And our veterans overseas and our veterans here at home are grateful and are ready to lead. We've got your back. Thank you very much. God, I got chills. And now because of the weather. Our next speaker, our last speaker, um, is the reason why the program exists and is successful. Dr. Joan Reedman, medical director. Thank you. At a time when there's so much discord and destruction in the headlines, it's truly heartening to see this bill passed. And I stand here today as Dr. Reidman, medical director of the Survivor Program, but I'm really representing all the other healthcare professionals, personnel, and physicians who've been involved. David Prezant, Michael Crane, Jackie Moline, so many others, and so many other people who you have not heard of who are taking care of all of these people that we're talking about. This act includes coverage for the survivors, community members, our lesser known heroes, those who are in the collapsing buildings, who reopen markets, offices, and homes amidst the dust and fumes to show that our country could not be shut down. As medical director of the survivor program, I hear the story of each new patient, and I hear these stories pour out still fresh and painful 14 years later. The physical and emotional wounds are still so much a part of all of these people's daily lives. This act that we're celebrating today eases some of this pain. Today I want to recognize our public hospitals that provided a medical home for these people and to thank all the elected officials, I'm going to leave many out, I'm not as good as you guys, <laughs> Gillibrand, Nadler, Maloney, King, all of you and all of those who worked so hard to get this bill passed, including labor, community members, this bill shows how people can come together to heal rather than to destroy. Yes. Thank you. That, that, I just wanna, uh, I just wanna, you know, five years ago they raised my arms 
And I just want to recapture that moment. So Senator Gillibrand Schumer, it's my turn to rip your shoulders out of your sock. That still hurts. If you guys have any questions on topic, uh, we'll be glad to answer them. Tomorrow. Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you.